What an incredible, incredible service so far. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for uh, just your sharing uh, and communion and uh, helping us to connect to uh, what Jesus is going to Thank you, Claude, for putting this recorder right here on the podium. And uh, thank you, uh, 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 Isaiah, for uh, your sharing and contribution on, and uh, just your, your incredible thoughts. Um, as we uh, reflect on uh, why we should give and, and just uh, the hearts we need to have behind our giving. Come on. Uh, if you're visiting for the first time uh, this Sunday, uh, we've been excitingly going through uh, a very fun study in the book of Zechariah. And uh, this is our second part of our series here. Ooh, the second two. And we're going to study out today Zechariah chapter 3 through chapter 6. Oh. And uh, last week we, we had an amazing time as we just learned a little bit more about the Old Testament and what God was doing during the time of Zechariah. Of course, we remember that at this time, God, through His sovereignty, Release the captives of Babylon, the, the Israelites that were captive in, in Babylon, to go back into Israel and rebuild the temple for the Lord. They go back, and you know how, what happens anytime you, you start to try to do something for God, opposition starts to, to occur. Yeah, that was right. And so, uh, therefore, opposition comes. And they, they, they threaten the Israelites who are building the temple. They discourage them. They try ultimately to get them to stop building the temple. And in 535 B.C., they, they actually succeed, and the temple building is stopped just one year after the captives go back to start the building. Wow. For 16 years, no one does anything to build up God's temple. Come on. Mm. Finally, in 520 B.C., God raises up two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, to get the people to get back to building. Yep. Of course, we know that Haggai was kind of like the, the older prophet. Uh, records in the book of Haggai itself that he was there at the original captivity. So he was at least 70 plus years old. Wow. You with me? Yeah. So he was like an old guy preaching the word like Tony Ventura. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, you guys. And then you got Zechariah. Most likely Haggai dies and that's why his book is so short because he passes away. Wow. But Zechariah is this young teenager on, who, who sees what God is doing through Haggai and goes, oh no, Haggai's dead. I, I got to pick up the mantle of leadership right here. Yeah. And so now Zechariah as a teenager raises up to preach the word to the people. Amen, guys? Amen. Come on. And so right here, we're going to pick it up uh, in Zechariah chapter 3. But to get our theme for the Bible study today, let's go to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Come on, man. Right here, God comes to Zechariah, and he says these words. This is the word of the Lord Almighty. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. That's the title of our lesson. Not by might, nor by power. You you, You can try to change your life by your own strength, but not by might, not by power. Only by God's Spirit. Yeah. We, we can try to do a lot of things for God. We can even try to build up God's church by our own strength. But, but not by might. Yeah. Not by power. Simply only by God's Spirit. And that's the point that God is trying to put into the people right here. That you can't do it your way and you can't do it with your strength. You have to do it by the Spirit of God. Now, now before we jump into the section of Scripture we're going to study today, there are some key people that I think we we need to identify. Number one, we we talked about Zechariah and Haggai, the two prophets that God raises up to preach the word to the people. The next person that we think we we need to talk about is Joshua the high priest. He is the spiritual leader of God's people at this time, the high priest. Then comes Zerubbabel. You go, well, who, who's Zerubbabel? Good question. Zerubbabel is the civil leader of God's people. He's the governor of Jerusalem, okay. the governor of Israel. Okay. You could kind of say he was the king. He was the guy in charge of everything non-spiritual. Amen. <laughs> so by Joshua's leadership and Zerubbabel's leadership, it kind of encompasses the entire leadership of the people of God. And then you finally got this one interesting person that is identified in chapters 3 through 6, the branch. Yeah. You know, who's the branch? The branch is an Old Testament prophecy of Jesus. Amen, guys? Oh. And we're going to see that as we go through the scriptures right here, Zechariah 3 through 6. Wow. Now, you go, well, why study out the book of Zechariah? Well, right here in chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. 
Ultimately, why do we read this story that occurred thousands of years ago? Because the story of Zechariah really is a story full of principles and things that were foreshadowings of everything that was to come. And so it absolutely applies to even us this morning. Amen, guys? Amen. Let's get into our text. Chapter 3, verse 1. Come on, Evan. All right, bro. Not by might, nor by power, but by God's Spirit. Come on, Evan. The Bible says right here, Then he showed me, he showed Zechariah, Joshua the high priest. Okay, so this is the spiritual leader of God's people. Standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side, to accuse him. Oh, that's not a good situation. The Lord said the same. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Wow. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off this filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I've taken away your sin and I'll put fine garments on you. Then I said, well, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge over my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, you are symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant, who? The branch. The branch, Jesus. Come on. See the stone I've set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Wow. Amen. And that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to come to church at the Toronto International Christian Church. <laughs> <laughs> to sit under your fig tree and declare the Lord Oh my God. Wow. Wow. What an incredible vision given to the prophet Zechariah. Of course, he got, he got Joshua and he's, and he's brought before the angel of the Lord. He's brought before God in, in sort of this courtroom like setting. Now, already that would be quite terrifying for most of us. I mean, you're, you're brought before God and you know that you're just filthy. Your sin is just all over you. You know, when you're just not doing very well spiritually. It just kind of shows all over your face. Yeah. I mean, imagine walking into the throne room of God to be judged full of sin. Wow. And then the Bible says that Satan is right next to you, accusing you, prosecuting you. Wow. Whoa. I mean, there's, there's nothing scary than what Joshua the high priest. Now, remember, he's the spiritual leader of the people. He's supposed to be, quote, unquote, spiritual. Yeah. Right. But right here, the Bible says that his clothes were filthy standing before the Lord. Wow. And yet God looks at Joshua and he looks at Satan and goes, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Wow. Take off his filthy clothes, put new clothes on him so he can be clean. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you, when you look at Satan right here, there's a number of names he has throughout the scriptures. Mm-hmm. I mean, very commonly, you see the word devil. In Greek, it's diabolos, or even in Spanish, it's diablos. And it literally means slanderer or defamer of character. Wow. wow. So, so Satan really just wants to tell people lies about other people, to tell God lies about you. He wants to slander you to make you look terrible to other people, to God. Right. Then there's Beelzebub. Well, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting name right there. It literally means Lord of the Flies. Wow. Now, this is kind of fascinating because there's other translations that translate it as Beelzebul, which means Lord of Filth, Lord of Dung. Meaning, he's Lord of Excrement. Other places in the Bible talk about how he's actually over the world, that Satan is in control of the world. And so if he's Lord of Dung, Lord of the world, what is the world? But filth and dung before God. Wow. There's other scriptures that talk about Satan as the serpent. We remember the Garden of Eden. Satan was a serpent who deceived Eve into eating the forbidden fruit. Right. And then you also got Lucifer, which means morning star. Yeah. Right. It's said throughout the Bible that L- Lucifer, Satan, was one of the most beautiful angels that God ever created. Yeah. Right. And yet right here we find that it's called Satan. 53 times in the Bible, that's the name given to him. You go, well, what does Satan mean? 
It means the accuser. Wow. Come on. And that's exactly what we find Satan doing right here before God. Prosecuting Joshua. Accusing Joshua. Right. Now it is interesting because there is one more name for Satan. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, he's referred to as the father of lies. I mean, it even says when he lies, he speaks his native language. No, for some of us, English is not our first language. Like we, all have, we all have our language that, that we really feel most comfortable speaking. For Satan, his language that he feels most comfortable speaking is lying. Wow. I mean, he just lies about everything. You know, hey, Satan, what time is it? Well, it's about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I mean, hey, where are we at? We're in the United States of America right now. I mean, it's... He lies about everything. And yet right here before God, as he's standing next to Joshua, he's not lying once. Everything he's saying is absolutely true about Joshua. And God looks and he goes, the Lord rebuke you. Is not this man right here a burning stick snatched from the fire? That's our first point this morning. Snatched from the fire. Come on, Evan. Come on, You know, we, we can try to get rid of our sin in many different ways. Yeah, that's true. We, we, we try to hide from it. We deny it. We try to forget it. Sometimes we even try to hide our sin. Even self-destructive thoughts sometimes come into our minds. All in an effort for us to try to get rid of our sin. But we try to pay it back. We try to do whatever it takes to get rid of it. And yet there's nothing you can do to remove sin from your life. Only God can remove sin, and yet God does. He snatches us from the fire. He looks at Joshua and he goes, dude, take off his filthy clothes, put clean clothes on him. And I love Zechariah 3, 5, because now it's not the angel of the Lord of God talking. Zechariah is standing there watching all this happen, and he goes, hey, uh, put a clean turban on his head too. You go, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, let's look back in Exodus chapter 28. Come on, Evan. Come on, Evan. I mean, Zechariah is just fired up about what he's seeing right here with Joshua the high priest. In Exodus 28, we find that God is actually directing them to create the priesthood and is directing the priests on how to make their priestly garments. And so in chapter 28, verse 36, we find these, these words. It says, make a plate of pure gold and engrave it on it as a, on a seal, holy to the Lord. Fasten a blue cord to attach it to the turban. It is to be in the front of the turban. And so the priests of the Old Testament would walk around with turbans and they would have a, a plate on their head that said, Holy to the Lord. And so right here, Joshua's before the Lord and he's going, Hey, take off his filthy clothes, put new clothes on him. And Zechariah goes, Oh God, 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 don't forget the turban. Don't forget to switch out his, his hat so people can know that this person is set apart for the Lord. He's holy to the Lord. Is that awesome or not? Wow. You know, I never forget, uh, you know, I, for those of you guys that know me, uh, I, I'm not much of an animal person. <laughs> uh, I grew up and, and all of my pets died very quickly. Uh, I even had a chicken that lasted one hour. <laughs> my dad brought it home. He goes, hey, you guys should name the chicken. I got a chicken for you. And he tied it down to the steak. And, and it was in our yard. And an hour later, we came out. And we like, dad, the, the chicken's sleeping. <laughs> the chicken had died one hour in my family. And uh, so I, I never really got a lot of attachment through animals. I mean, I, I just, you know, I just never really cared for animals that much. And so I, I don't really have that much of a desire to have pets. Now, my wife, on the other hand, grew up on a ranch. I mean, she had sheep, she had horses, she had llamas at one point. I mean, she had all kinds of animals, dogs all the time growing up. And so, of course, in our marriage, she goes, babe, we, I, I really want to have a dog. I go, babe, we're not going to have a dog. She goes, babe, I really, I want a dog. I grew up with dogs. I grew up with animals. Can you please get a dog? Babe, we can't get a dog. <laughs> Finally, I succumbed to her peer pressure. <laughs> and she just like Delilah kept pursuing me day after day after day after day. Oh, <laughs> and I said, okay, babe, look, we're building a house right now. And once the house is finished, I'll, I'll make you promise. Once we get the house finished, then we can get a dog. Okay? She goes, okay, that'd be great. <laughs> well, uh, the house is finished. And some time went by. And let's just say we, we didn't get a dog. And I wasn't going to bring it up because I didn't want a dog. <laughs> and uh, one day, we're, we're just at the house, and, and this little dog wanders into our yard. Small, small little dog about this big. 
Now some of you guys are going, oh, trust me. If you saw this thing, that's not what you'd be thinking. <laughs> it came into our yard and, and from head to toe, no exaggeration, it was covered in fleas and in ticks. It had obviously been neglected. It had been abused. And I mean, it's, it's just, it was, a, it was a white dog, but I, I genuinely thought it was black because of how many fleas and ticks were covering. Wow. Its stomach was enlarged, and I found out that when it, when it actually went to the bathroom, its excrement was moving. Whoa. It was enlarged because it was full of all sorts of parasites wow. inside of it. Yikes. And I'll never forget, the dog wanders in our yard, and I'm just looking at that, and I'm, just, I'm going to throw up. And my wife puts a blanket over it and grabs it, and with her big old eyes, looks up at me. <laughs> and I'm standing over her, and I'm just like, oh, no. <laughs> and I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> she goes, babe, can we keep it? <laughs> like, what, are you, what are you thinking? <laughs> I mean, there's so many beautiful animals that are out there. I all of a sudden started to like other dogs. <laughs> she goes, babe, I, I really want to keep this dog. I go, well, you got you to gotta fix this thing. I mean, she, she wraps it in a blanket. She takes it to the pound, and she, she brings it to the counter of the pound. And she goes, hey, guys, can you, can you do anything? The guy at the counter goes, look, I'm going to be honest with you. If you give me that dog, I'm going to be forced to kill it. I'm going to be forced to put it to sleep. To put it, to sleep. I mean, there, there's there's so many dogs here, and we, we just don't take dogs in her condition. <laughs> she starts crying, tears coming down her face. Guys, like I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. She gets the dog, starts to walk away, and right when she's about to leave the parking lot, one of the other workers drives up, and she sees my wife's tears just coming down her face and holding the dog. She goes, well, "What's going on?" Kelly explains the whole story to this woman. She goes, hey, look, I'll tell you what. I'm not supposed to do this. Give me the dog. I'll take it. I'll keep it overnight. I'll, I'll take off all of the fleas and the ticks. I'll take out the worms inside the parasites. And tomorrow morning before we open, you, you have to come back and take the dog. And that's exactly what my wife did. That dog became our dog for many years. And she lived. But I think about that and I go, that was us. Mm. Right. We're the dog. Come on. Yeah. Approaching God, covered in fleas and ticks, mm. covered in our sin, mm. full of parasites inside of us, yeah. bad attitudes, guilt, deceit. And in every way, God should have just killed the dog. Yeah. And yet he looks at us, full of parasites, full of fleas and ticks, is not that mad. A burning stick snatched from the fire. Wow. 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 Snatched from the fire. Wow. You know, today's, today's going to be exciting as we see Dio snatched from the fire. Come on, Dio! It's going to be exciting to see Rich snatch from the fire. Come on, turn that on. And I promise you, if Satan had his way, they would not be here today. If Satan had his way, they would receive the full punishment for their sin. And by their own power, by their own might, there's nothing they can do to take their sin away. But by God's spirit, God is going to reach down and snatch them from that fire of punishment, that fire of judgment, Amen. and save them as they go into the water of baptism and resurrect to, the Bible says, a new life. Amen, guys. <laughs> Let's keep reading in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Preach. Great stuff. It's a good one. <laughs> we go on right here. We find the fifth vision given to Zechariah. It says, then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. Nobody likes to be woken up. No, 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 no. He asked me, what do you see? I mean, he's just waking up. What do you see? Well, this is a little sudden. I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. 
Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. But I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I ain't ever led. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you'll become level ground. Then he will bring out of the capstone to shouts of, God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things, since the seven eyes of the Lord that reigns throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? Your blood, do you not know what these are? Well, no, my Lord, that's why I just asked. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Wow, this is amazing. Here, Zechariah Zachariah's just waking up. Boom, angel just puts him in this vision. What do you see? I'm just kind of waking up here, but I, I see this lampstand with seven lamps on the lampstand. You go, what, what in the world is, is going on right here for Zechariah? You know, it's amazing. All throughout the Bible, and specifically in Revelation, the lampstands are a reference to in the New Testament, God's churches, but in the Old Testament, the people of God. Mm -hmm. So these lamps and the lampstands are God's people. They're representative of all God's people. Seven representing completion. You with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at the, the top of these lamps, the Bible says that they each had a channel going into it. On the other end of this channel, it was connected to these two olive trees. And even the angel goes, do you know what these are? And of course, Zechariah had no idea. Well, right here, it's very interesting. The Bible is talking about Zerubbabel finishing the building of the temple. Yeah. And that's why he says right here, who are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you'll become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of, God bless it, God bless it. The capstone is very different than the cornerstone. Oftentimes in the Bible, they'll talk about the cornerstone. And that was the first stone laid in the foundation of something. The capstone was the last stone at the top of a temple. They'll put the capstone to cap off what they've already completed. Yep. Wow. And so right here, Zerubbabel is being talked about is the guy who is going to put the capstone on the temple. He's going to finish building the temple. Is that awesome? Wow. And yet the, the, the attitude of the people when the temple is built is, God bless it. God bless it. They're going to be so fired up. Mm. Come on. But you go, well, why wasn't the temple built prior? Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit. What do these channels and the two olive trees represent? The oil in the lamps would burn, thus producing light. The channel was a channel providing oil to the lamps directly from what tree? Olive. An olive tree. What was the oil used in the Old Testament right here? Olive, olive oil. He's saying there's going to be a constant flow of oil into these lamps to keep them burning. Wow. To keep wow. the people building and working to build the temple. Not by power. Not by might. But by God's spirit that is being flowed to them constantly from the olive trees. Come on, come on. Now here's the question. At the end right there, Zechariah goes, now what are these two olive trees? What, what do these two olive branches represent? And God's response is, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Well, who were the two leaders of the people? Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel. You with me? Come on, bro. So in other words, the, the picture that is being drawn right here for Zechariah is that God's leadership, the leadership of the people, are going to turn people back to God through the scriptures and through God's spirit, they're going to constantly have the strength and the energy and the desire to build the temple for God. Amen. Our second point this morning is build and never get tired. Build and never get tired. You know, sometimes as we're disciples and we're trying to build God's kingdom, we can get to places where we're discouraged. We can get to places where we're tired or burnt out. 
And then we can draw a conclusion from the fact that we're feeling tired or we're feeling burnt out that this must just be too hard for us to do. And like the people right here in the Old Testament, they quit building God's temple. They quit building God's kingdom. When in essence, the issue is not that the challenge is too tough, but our relationship with God is too weak. Wow. Come on, Preach, bro. Come on, bro. That we don't have a connection to God's power. We don't have a connection to God, period. Thus, the, the, the oil that flows into us has stopped. And we no longer can burn for the Lord. Come on, bro. To build and never get tired. You know, I remember as a kid, I had uh, this toy car. And uh, I, I thought it was the coolest little thing as a kid because it had these front headlights that turned on. Yeah. And I was like, this is awesome. But over time, the headlights broke and they would no longer turn on. So I was curious uh, as a kid and I had this car and I said, like, well, it's, it's broken. I, I got to take it apart and fix it. <laughs> so as a kid, you know, my dad had tools and so I went and found some screwdrivers and started taking apart this, this toy car. I was nine, nine years old, eight years old. And I took about this car and I found that the headlights were powered by these two wires. And these two wires were no longer connected to any power source. So I go, wow. If that headlight could be connected to a battery, that is pretty cranky. What if I connected it directly to a wall outlet? No. <laughs> I mean, that's really going to be cranky. And it's amazing how it worked out because there was two wires and I looked and there were two holes in the wall outlet. <laughs> I thought, this is perfect. Little tiny little baby light right there and then got the two wires and I lined them up to the wall outlet. Oh my God. Ready to see this thing. Was like, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> and I zoned in and, and it got closer and, and, it, and it got right to the edge of the wall and I was kind of expecting something to happen but I didn't know what was going to happen and I went a little bit further nothing happened a little bit further in nothing happened and the, the, the tips of the wires were just about ready to touch the electrical current and then I went a little bit further and all of a sudden pop oh. I mean I swear my face was black <laughs> <laughs> I mean this little tiny light just exploded little shards of tiny baby glass oh my God. was everywhere <laughs> I mean when you're connected to something that powerful I mean how bright are you going to burn as a disciple the reason why you're not fired up the reason why you don't have energy to keep on going the reason why you're tired and burnt out is because you're not connected to God but when you're connected to God you can build and never get tired and I love the fact that it talks about these two guys these leaders nothing special not by strength, not by might, not by our own power, but by God's Spirit. And yet, through them steering people back to God, they could bring energy and strength back into the people. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. You know, when I think about these two guys, I can't help but think about our first principle stocks. Come on. How important it is to lead people to God. Yeah. How important it is to get people to connect. Yeah. Like that, that, that wire going into the wall outlet so that they can be powered by God. And yet so many people have no idea how to help people get close to God. Wow. So many people have no idea how to help somebody become a Christian. Yeah. Like, hey, just read these books. Maybe something will hit you. Or just show up and maybe something will happen. Maybe an epiphany will happen. And then in the scriptures, you see disciples making disciples. Yeah. Getting people to, into a relationship with God. Bringing people into God's kingdom. Wow. Yeah. Look over at Romans chapter 10. Great stuff, bro. Awesome. Come on, bro. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. The Bible says, How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? There it is. And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet. Of those who bring good news. Yeah, true. <laughs> Incredible scripture. The Bible goes, man, if you want to help people, help people by preaching the word of God. Amen. Be someone sent from God. Bring the good news to people. Right. And the Bible goes, man, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. What is that talking about? Them? I've seen some pretty ugly feet in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole principle is that when, when somebody hears the truth, when they hear the word of God, 
They're so blown away that they fall down on their knees. And what are they looking at? But the feet of the messenger who just brought the good news. Yeah. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? You know, I remember uh, a story my little brother shared with me. He went to get a pedicure with his wife. I've heard that some of you guys are into these type of things. I don't, I don't want to point anybody out. But. Um, I mean, Isaiah has mentioned it once or twice. Bro! And uh, so my little brother goes to, to get a, a foot massage and a pedicure. And uh, him and, and his wife were, were sitting there in the chairs. And of course, they, they bring out a tub of water and they had their feet soaking in the tub of water. And they're just kind of sitting there talking. And, and then these two uh, Chinese ladies come out to work on their feet. First one picks up his wife's feet, starts working on them, starts doing her nails and doing a pedicure. The second one looks at Levi's feet. <laughs> <laughs> She goes, excuse me a second. <laughs> she leaves. At this point, he has no idea where she's gone. His wife is just, her feet's being worked on, and she's all happy. She's massaging the feet as they paint the nails and everything. And finally, the lady comes back. She pulls out her hands, and she's got two thick rubber gloves. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at that point, he got the clue. His feet were not very awesome. You know, guys, a lot of us have some pretty ugly feet. And I'm not even talking about in a physical sense. We're incapable of bringing the good news to people. And therefore, our feet... <laughs> it's going to take a lot of work here. Come on, Evan. We've got to have a deep conviction to know the scriptures. Yes. We've got to have a deep conviction that we have to learn how to help other people become Christians. Yep. Yeah. Because only through leading them back to God are they going to have the strength, the power to make it, to build his kingdom. Yeah. You know, sometimes even as a side, we can have weak, quiet times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We can have shallow prayers. We can have mediocre times reading our Bible. Mm. Now, at the end of the day, if you don't get close to God, you're not going to have the oil to produce the fire that God wants to have burn in your life. Build and never get tired. You got snatched from the fire. But once you've been snatched, you've got to do something for God. Build and never get tired. And our last point, more honor than even desired. Wow. More honor than even desired. Let's go back to Zechariah chapter, chapter 5. You guys got to admit, it's fun studying out the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Come on, Evan. Zechariah chapter 5. Come on, Evan. In verse 1, we, we find, again, Zechariah's sixth vision. As I looked again, there before me was a flying scroll. He asked me, well, what do you see? How did I see a flying scroll on me? I know what I'm seeing right now. It's a flying scroll. <laughs> 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. 10 meters by 5 meters. And he said to me, this is the curse that is going out of the whole, over the whole land. For according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house of the thief. And anyone who swears falsely by my name, it will remain in the house and destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. And the angel who was speaking to me came forward and said, look up and see what's appearing. I asked, what is it? He replied, it's a basket. And he added, this is the iniquity of the people throughout the land. Then the cover of, the lead, 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 the cover of lead was raised and there in the basket sat a woman. He said, this is wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and pushed its lead cover down on it. Then I looked up and there before me were two women with the wind in their wings. They had wings like those of a stork and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. Where, they, where, where were they taking the basket? I asked the angel who was speaking to me. He replied to the country of Babylon to build a house for it there. When the house is ready, the basket will be set there in its place. <laughs> 
this is getting pretty weird. Yeah. Well, I mean, here, here's Zechariah, and once again, the angel shows him a vision, and it's of this flying scroll. I mean, what, what do you see, a flying scroll? I mean, 15 or 10 meters by 5 meters. So this is huge. And the Bible says it's got writing on both sides. God doesn't like to waste paper. You with me? <laughs> and so he's got it on one side, and he's got it on the other side. And all that's written on the one side is every thief will be banished. Okay. Apparently in very big letters. And then on the other side, it says everyone who swears falsely will be banished. Okay, this is, this is very interesting. He's just seeing this scroll flying around. Then, at the second part of the vision right here, he sees a basket with a woman who the, the Bible identifies as wickedness. And that basket is covered with lead to really hold it into that basket. And it's therefore sent back into Babylon. The symbol of, of that is, is fairly clear that there was wickedness that they had brought with them from Babylon, where they were held in captivity. And God goes, box that up and send it right back to Babylon. Oh, wow. You're to be different. You're to be holy. You're to be special. You're to be my people. And yet it's interesting to me because the only other reference in the Bible to someone stealing from God is in Malachi 3 where it equates not giving to God as robbing God. Wow. Yep. At the end of the day, one of the things that they brought out of Babylon was greedy hearts and a worldly perspective on money. I mean, Babylon was one of the richest countries in the world. Even now, you can go back and look at artifacts that were covered in gold. Babylon was known as the gold empire. And the people looked at all the wealth in Babylon, and their hearts started to get pretty greedy. Haggai records that instead of building the temple, they started building their own houses. They stopped giving to God and started being selfish with their own lives. You with me right here, guys? Yeah. You know, for me, I, I'm very excited... Uh, to have our special missions contribution. Yeah. Come on. Come on, now, this is challenging. Mm -hmm. I love to sacrifice, but I hate to sacrifice all at the same time. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't doesn't really equal a sacrifice unless it's a little bit painful. Right. You with me? Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm gonna be honest. I, I was fired up. Of course, we're, we're trying to raise twelve times uh, our missions or our normal weekly contribution uh, together fourteen thousand dollars. And uh, I, I was, I, I can say, honestly, without trying to boast here, that I was very responsible in planning my finances. I had a plan. I had an idea. I figured out how we were going to do it. I got it all together, and I started doing it. I started doing it. And then I looked at my bank account, and you guys might relate to me here, and I realized that while I had made that plan, there was like five checks that I had written that hadn't gone through yet. Oh. And all of a sudden, my plan that I thought was super awesome, <laughs> It's not working. I looked at it. I go, babe, we got no money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we just got paid. Uh -huh. So that means 15 more days to our next paycheck. And we got nothing. What are we going to do with this? How are we going to do this missions contribution? And I'll be honest. There, there's things in my life that I haven't been able to pay for for some time. If you know me, when I drive up, you hear me from a mile away. Because my <laughs> brakes squeak all the way. <laughs> I just like to, to make an entrance when I arrive. I would love to not have squeaky brakes. I would love for not every single person in Toronto to know who's driving that car when he's driving. But it's to God's glory because God wants us to be all about building his temple. Not about building our own lives. About building his kingdom. Now look at this. Chapter 6, verse 9. The word of the Lord came to me. Take silver and gold from the exiles. Oh, I mean, wow, he doesn't say ask for it. He doesn't say plead with the people for it or negotiate with them for it. He says, take it from the exiles, Heldai, Tobijah, and Zediah. I mean, these three guys, these four guys, like come out of Babylon. Yes, yeah, guys, that's awesome. Let's go build this temple. Hey, dude, you three. Give me all your money. <laughs> Whoa, you got to admit, that's pretty intense right there. Like, I mean, there's thousands of us, dudes. Why us three? It says, take money from them who have arrived from Babylon. Go, to the same day, uh, go the same day to the house of Josiah and the Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold and make it a crown. That's it. You're going to take all my money and turn it into a crown? Really? 
Now look at this. And set it on the head of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehoshadak. Wow, that doesn't seem fair. They're going to take the money from the people, turn it into a crown, and then the high priest. Hey, guys, check it out. This is awesome. Wow. Verse 12. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man who's named the branch. And he will branch out from this place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord. And he will be clothed with majesty. And will sit and rule on his throne. And he will be a priest on his throne. And there will be harmony between the two. We'll stop there. Wow. He says, make this crown for Joshua. But, but, but then he, he also kind of refers to the man wearing the crown as the branch. Yeah. You said that the branch was Jesus, not Joshua. Well, we're going to get down to the bottom of this right here. Come on, Evan. The name Jesus comes from the Old Testament name <clears throat> Joshua. There it is. Mm. And it means Savior. Yeah. Wow. So even Joshua the high priest is a foreshadowing of not just Jesus coming as the Messiah, but Jesus' name being given as Jesus. Wow. I mean, is that awesome or not? <clears throat> And who's the crown for? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, come on. To sit on his throne and rule the people as they build his temple. Well, that's, that's pretty awesome. But look at verse 14. The crown has on Jesus. And then in verse 14, it says, the crown will be given to... Wow! Heldai, Tobijah, Jediah, and handsome of Zephaniah. Those are the guys they took the money from. Wow. Mm. That's crazy. As a memorial in the temple of the Lord, those who are far away will come and help to build the temple of the Lord, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent you. This will happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. Wow. wow. What's happening right here? You know, perhaps some subtu- the Septuagint translation will give us a little bit better insight. Instead of these names, the Septuagint has it, Heldai is translated as rulers. So the royalty of the people. So Abijah is translated as those who are useful or skilled, so therefore the successful businessmen. And Jediah, those who are well known, the celebrities of the people. And then later on it includes him, which simply means the gracious one. Who were the people that gave the money? The successful businessmen, the rulers, those that were well known, the celebrities. And then those that just felt like being gracious. They gave the money to God. Right. It was turned into a crown for Jesus. And the image right here that Zechariah has given is that Jesus takes the crown that was given to him, puts it on, looks at the people, and then he looks at those that have sacrificed. And he goes, hey, come on up here. Takes his crown off. Goes, here you go. Which you've given to Jesus. Jesus gives right back. Is that, this is fire love. I mean, can you imagine going to heaven? You spent your whole life working for God. You've given all you have for Jesus. You, you've stored up all these things. And you, you go to heaven and you, you see Jesus up on his throne and you go, man, I live for this. And then Jesus looks back at you and says, hey, why don't you come on up here? Wow. I have something for you. More honor than even desire. And he closes out here and he says, Those who are far away are going to come and help build. And this is all going to happen if you just diligently obey the word of the Lord. Remember, these are things written, men symbolic of things to come. It absolutely applied to Zechariah in his time, but it absolutely applies to us in our time. And right here we find that God gives us more honor than we ever deserved. And more honor than we even desired. We don't even know what God has in store for us. But the question is, while you're here, are you going to do what you're going to do for God? Are you going to obey God's word? Are you going to give what you can give for Jesus to rule his temple? I'll close with the story about a uh, king and his daughter. He was a king, it was a small country, and he, 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 he was, it was time for his daughter to get married. And so he put out a message to all the young men. He says, hey, why don't you guys come 
and I want you guys to, to do something to win the hand of my daughter. I don't want to just give her to some other king. I want you to do something to win the hand of my daughter. So, so thousands and thousands of these young men show up to, to get married to the princess, to get married to the king's daughter. And so they come and the guy goes, okay, well, here's the thing. I want you guys to prove to me that you can do great things. I want to prove to me your greatness before I hand my daughter over to you. And so he goes through and he gives each one of these guys a small little seat. Here's your seat. Here's your seat. Here's your seat. And he goes, look, I want you to, to plant this seed. I want you to take care of it. I want you to nourish this seed and, and raise up an incredible plant. Because if you can raise up a seed, if you can take care of and nurture a seed, then you can take care of and nurture my daughter. And so all the guys just fired up, excited. They take this little seed and plant it at home. And, and for months and months and months, they're just working, working to grow up this seed into an incredible plant. Well, this one guy, he gets the seed and he, he goes home, he plants it, he fertilizes it, he waters it, and, and months go by and nothing happens. Not even, not even a bud comes out of the seed. <laughs> I'm never going to get the princess like this. And so he goes back to the story. He goes, I don't know what's going on right here. I've got to figure out how to get this thing going. He puts more fertilizer on there. He's watering it. He's watering it. He's trying to do whatever he can. And this guy was a farmer. He was great at growing things. But he just could not figure out how to get the seed to actually grow. Time and time again, he's just working at it, working at it, working at it. Months go by, months go by, and still nothing to show for him trying to grow the seed. Finally, the day comes to go back to the king to show the king what you've built. And I mean, he was just so embarrassed. He didn't even want to go, but at the end of the day, he goes, you know, I just, I just got to go and show him what I at least tried to do. So he goes and he's walking with his plan. And as he gets closer, he sees these thousands of guys all with these amazing plants. I mean, big bushes and trees and, and flowers. And he goes, man, there's no way I'm going to get this princess. One by one, they each go before the king and look at my awesome plants. Look at what I've been able to do. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at the fruit it's yielding. It's amazing. And one by the one, the king goes, eh, pass. Eh, pass. Finally, he gets to this guy. <laughs> it's just a, an empty container with dirt. And he gets up in front of the king, and the king goes, how dare you bring that to me? I've got all these guys that have all these beautiful plants that have done incredible things with what I've given them. What makes you think that I'm going to give you my daughter when you can't even grow a plant? He goes, well, I I'm so sorry. I've tried my best. I've done exactly what you've asked me to do, but nothing happened. He goes, well, tell me what you've done. He goes, I've fertilized it. I've watered it, but not even a bud. He goes, you want to hear a secret? That goes, yeah, I want to hear a secret. He goes, what I gave to each one of these guys was a dead seed. And you're the only one that was honest enough wow. to obey what I've asked you to do. Whoa. And so my daughter goes to you. Wow. Wow. You know, guys, sometimes we can look at other people's lives yeah. and we go, man, those are some pretty awesome plants. Wow. And you know, God has just asked us to do what he's asked us wow. to do. Yeah. Yeah. And who will the honor that God gives go to? Not those that have these incredible lives, mm -hmm. but those who did it God's way. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Not by power, not by might, Come on, bro. but by the Spirit of the Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. God can snatch us from the fire. Come on. Come on. We can build and never get tired. And at the end of the day, God's going to give us more honor than even desired. You guys have a great afternoon. I love you. God bless you.